Good to see you. Um, thank you so much for coming out on this snowy evening. Uh, we really appreciate your joining us. We're, we're thrilled you're here. My name is Stephanie Plunkett. I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator. Um, so International Women's Day was uh, designated by the United Nations to honor women's rights and achievements throughout history and across nations. And um, this special event uh, was created in collaboration with editor Anastasia Stanmeyer and Berkshire Magazine. Uh, and it showcases the work of the amazing Susan Kopich, whose powerful artworks are beautifully featured in the magazine's spring issue, which I just happen to have here. And uh, actually, Anastasia has brought copies for everyone to take home, so maybe Susan would even sign them. Oh. <laughs> that would be exciting. Um, Susan's art and this conversation, led by Norman Rockwell Museum director Laurie Norton Moffat, uh, could not be more timely in light of recent events. As you probably know, beginning in October 2017, the Me Too movement spread virally as a hashtag used on social media to help demonstrate the prevalence of sexual harassment and assault towards women. Looking back at earlier women's causes, the anti-slavery and temperance movements sowed the first seeds of feminism in the mid-19th century, when in 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott were denied seats at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London due to their gender. Uh, moving up a little bit after World War II, a growing number of women pursued higher education and entered the workforce, but they weren't able to break the glass ceiling. The women's liberation movement of the late 1960s and 1970s emerged from women's desires to revolutionize the fundamental aspects of female life at the time, domesticity, <coughs> employment, education, and sexuality. In 1966, Betty Friedan and other prominent feminists formed the National Organization of Women, which advanced many feminist causes, both then and now. Here at the Norman Rockwell Museum, um, right in the adjoining gallery, actually, uh, the gift, the, um, the art of another gifted um, visual communicator, female visual communicator, Gloria Stoll Karn, um, is helping us to celebrate Women's History Month uh, because she, uh, who is now at age 94, was actually one of the very few women illustrators of pulp magazines in the 1940s. Uh, there might have been two or three. And uh, she's quite extraordinary. We, we opened her show recently, and she um, was really amazed that there was such interest in the work that she had done, you know, 75 years ago when she was uh, just a teenager and in her 20s. So I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at that exhibition. Um, we are so glad you're here to learn more about Susan Kopich's extraordinary photographs, which inspire new consideration of women's roles through irony, metaphor, and humor. Um, a question and answer period will actually uh, follow the conversation between Laurie and Susan. And of course, don't forget to take your magazine home. But it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to Berkshire Magazine editor, uh, Anastasia Stanmeyer, who um, has been such a great collaborator in this process. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so tonight's dialogue with Susan Kopich uh, kicks off a quarterly series, uh, Bringing It Home, um, presented by Berkshire Magazine and the Norman Rockwell Museum. Um, so Bringing It Home takes current issues found on the national and international stage and brings them home for us to examine and discuss as a community through ways such as this. And what a great way to launch such a collaborative series on this day, um, International Women's Day. And this talk, the talks continue throughout the year. And we've set dates already, um, although the topics are still developing as the events occur. So it's on June 28th, September 27th, and December 6th. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how I connected with Susan. Um, I was invited by photographer uh, Cassandra Sohn, who's Right there. <laughs> um, to review portfolios um, for a second time, actually, at her gallery in Lenox last year. 
And Susan presented her work to me, and right away it drew me in um, from her first project, Domestic Bliss, to her current and ongoing work, uh, Then He Forgot My Name, which we'll explore today, and also which is uh, featured in the magazine. So she stood out to me as a woman and a fellow human being who's putting it out there, her commentary on society on multiple levels. She brings forward in her artistry a sense of humor, poignancy, urgency, and fortitude. And she's not only the photographer, um, you'll see she's also the subject, the director, the actor, the costume designer, you name it. Um, the driving point in both bodies of work, which you'll be seeing um, this evening, is the internal dialogue that she reveals uh, to us to examine. She's opened a door for us to step into and explore. And in this latest work, that door leads us into an old factory um, in Youngstown, uh, Ohio, that's uh, symbolic of the decay of herself, her father, her country, uh, <clears throat> through the perspective of a woman. So I found a connection to her work, and I was excited to present this to the magazine, in the magazine, this woman's, woman's societal perspective against the current backdrop of hashtag me too. And that's what Berkshire Magazine's all about, um, <coughs> highlighting the talent within the Berkshires. Not only published her photographs in the spring issue, but you'll also see an essay that she's written. And I encourage you to take a copy, which is, um, which is available here, um, and, um, and take a look and read it and, and, and enjoy what's in there. And now we turn to tonight's presentation, which is a conversation with images between Lori Norton Moffitt, uh, director and CEO of the Rockwell Museum, and Susan. During this presentation, they'll explore, <coughs> compare, and contrast um, Norman Rockwell's work against Susan's as we look at how much things have changed and how much they haven't. Um, so a little bit about our two speakers. Lori Norton Moffitt is a leading scholar of American illustration art She's authored the Norman Rockwell Catalog Raisonné and led the growth of the museum from a small house in the artist's hometown to, be a, to becoming a global leader in illustration, art exhibitions, scholarship, and digital collections connectivity. She founded the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies, the nation's first art history scholarly Institute in American Illustration Art, which is a hub of illustration, art collections, museums, libraries, universities, scholars, curators, and professors across the country. In recognition of the museum's national service, President George W. Bush bestowed the National Humanities Medal to the museum, and President Barack Obama invited Lori to the White House with the Norman Rockwell's painting, The Problem We All Live With, which is here right yes, now. Yes, it's right in the corner yes. gallery. Uh, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement. She was a cultural specialist to Ethiopia <clears throat> and Russia. Wow, this is fascinating. <laughs> um, with the U.S. State Department, a national arts leader, she has served on the boards of the American Alliance of Museums and Association of Art Museum Directors and convening with national arts strategy. Currently, she serves on the boards of the Berkshire Bank, Berkshire Health Systems, and Connecticut College. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Art History from Connecticut College and her MBA from, the, from UMass. Susan Kopich is an award-winning photographer born in Youngstown, did I pronounce that right? Youngstown. Um, Ohio, received her BFA in performance and choreography from Ohio State University and has, and has had professional careers as a modern dancer, mm -hmm. actor, and Pilates studio owner. S looking to explore new forms of art and self-expression, Kopich returned to academia at New York City's International Center of Photography. She's primarily known for her dark and witty humor portrayed in her 2014 photographic series, Domestic Bliss. The series gives voice to Kopich's inner darkness while examining family life in a humorous context. Her series has been written up and reviewed in dozens of different languages around the world. Kopich currently, current Kopich's current project, Then He Forgot My Name, explores nostalgia, memory, and loss. The Cupcake, a short film that she also um, produced, 
uh, was released in 2016. Her work is in private collections as well as shown nationally in galleries and museums. Susan lives in neighboring New York, sometimes considered the Berkshires too, um, with her husband, um, who's here tonight too, and their two daughters who attend Berkshire schools. She's part of a group exhibition that will be held at Sohn Gallery in Lenox, opening March 23rd, with a reception on April 28th. And that's called Domestication. So on to Lori and Susan. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. We're so pleased to be hosting this partnership with Berkshire Magazine, connecting art and current events. And we greatly thank you for bringing Susan's fascinating body of work to the museum. And I'm really thrilled to see so many of you out tonight. Mm -hmm. I think you're the first brave Berkshireites who have gone out all day today. <laughs> we have a lot of creative women in the audience, photographers, <clears throat> and they're equally creative uh, partners and, and our, our very many men friends here. So thanks for coming out. I think you will not be disappointed with this fascinating evening. And we're really delighted to have you here tonight, Susan. And we thought this conversation format would be interesting um, to talk about Susan's work. And we got the idea to try to contrast it a bit with Rockwell to anchor this idea that they both were commenting on current events and life in their time, and particularly the role of women. It certainly seems a fitting day on International Women's Day yes. uh, to explore themes of exterior expectations of women and the interior thoughts of women's lives. I want to talk for a moment about a domestic archetype of mother. And when I set out to select the Rockwell images, um, I started thinking about, well, what, what's the dominant image of, of a woman? How is it? Um, created by Norman Rockwell in the last century. And, and Susan, I first learned of and became intrigued with your work when I saw it at the Sohn Gallery in an exhibition that oh, yes. I also um, participated in a, a jury a couple of years ago. And my initial reaction at the time was that your work was a drama. It was theatrical, it was staged, and it felt um, in many ways to me inauthentic in its... Um, what it's, its message, it was a story, just mm -hmm. like Rockwell's, it was a story. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, to me, feel like it represented the lives of women that I knew. And it seemed to me it dealt with cliches of white suburban middle class housewives, and on one level, it seemed frivolous. I looked deeper, and in seeing the whole arc of your work, I began to see it as something very different from mm -hmm. seeing one or two images. And while your work explores the myth of domestic bliss, it's also edgy, it's dark, it's filled with humor. It has hints of violence, malevolent thoughts. It's fraught with symbols of guns, knives, a noose. And even the sweetness of sugar is evil. <laughs> of course, many people have a similar reaction to Norman Rockwell's work. It's cliched saccharine, staged, and only represents white middle-class America, perhaps a more working-class citizen at the time, but I think the idea of classism is uh, apparent in both of these artists' work. Um, and there's a perception that Rockwell painted 20th century heteronorm of the nuclear paternal family, as seen here in this iconic freedom from want. And yet to me, in this picture, the strength is there in the mother, the grandmother, and um, the two images stand strongly as uh, having maternal anchors in their families. So in looking for Rockwell works to contrast with Susan, I, I went about it expecting to find a commonality <coughs> in Rockwell's themes of motherhood and family, and when I was thinking about this talk, um, I was intrigued actually to discover there is not a dominant theme of female domesticity in Rockwell's work, which we'll explore uh, a little bit throughout the talk tonight as we move through Susan's striking photographs. And we'll see that Rockwell actually represents women in a range of roles, some of them very strong. And after seeing your full portfolio of work, I see that you're doing that too. Aiming to show women in their fullest dimension 
rejecting the cliches of blissful motherhood and perfect marriages, you expose some of our darkest thoughts, thoughts that women are often not permitted to express and are judged if we do. So can you tell us uh, a little bit about this first section um, in your series, Domestic Bliss, that we are looking at the domestic ar archetype. We'll start with your happy days, happy um, days. picture. Sure, um, well I began the series wanting to take an axiom or an idiom and then jump, allowing that to allow me to jump off into my creativity. So here I took, um, don't know what goes on behind closed doors or can't judge a book by its cover. And basically for me it was my commentary on how a family can live a public life um, that's far from their private lives. And I wanted to show with that, you know, we can have this perfect ideal life, but then there's always something lurking of darkness behind that and that that's a fuller, richer life than just that projection of perfection. And, and so the noose is symbolism of darker thoughts, um, darker ideas, darker days. First of all, it's my lighthearted look at how a mother's time is never her own, right? And it belo belongs to the family at large. For me, it's also my commenting on the efforts of like home-cooked meals versus then I have a reference up there of the Campbell soup can and so here she is is having a heart you know she's working really hard and canning and her kind of teenage daughter is having camel soup um, which is also <laughs> my nod to Andy Warhol of course I loved what you had said um, yeah, was, I, I asked your... um, Susan about uh, what was a distinctly uncomfortable feeling of the sexuality and uh, sexual relationship between the parents taking place right in front of the children in the kitchen, the scene of domestic life, and right. that was very jarring to me. Right. And I was curious um, how you saw to put that in the picture. Yeah, well, I loved that you saw that, um, and I, I don't even think I was thinking that. I wanted to show how a mother or the female body is just like, sometimes it's not her own or her time or anything. But I love the fact that you saw that as well, which is important because we don't always, you know, everyone sees something different. Well, and of course, everybody brings their own perspectives <laughs> exactly. to an image and exactly. sees many. There's so many rich details in your work, Susan, that uh, it's really fun. Like Rockwell, um, you can look at an image over and over and see new things that you might have missed the first time. I like what Lori also said, that, that red tomato oh, sauce, yeah. it was <laughs> like, it was blood or it was, you know, so oh, I felt like that was a really rich. Metaphor. Um, yeah, metaphor. Life. For, yeah. yeah. Mm. You chose All American for this domestic archetype also. All American, as American as apple pie. And if you look at the image and you kind of scan around, you'll see that there's a gun there in the forefront. And it's kind of my take on, you know, guns in America. I really, really was searching for a way to bring this into my work because I struggle with it all the time. And um, unfortunately, when I finished shooting this, the next morning we woke up to the gun massacre in Mkwa um, Community College in Oregon. So it was um, a very odd connection, but it happened. So, um, but then you can see her, she, you know, she's standing there like a pinup girl too. So I'm always playing with this tension of look at me um, or look at her. Um, the salesmanship. I want to draw the audience in with bright colors. I want to seduce them, then turn them a little bit and welcome them into my world and welcome them into a, just a deeper thought, darker thoughts, but with that seduction of lighting and color and beauty and composition. And you'll have that sense of the male gaze uh, just outside the view of the picture, but he has a direct line in yeah. to... Uh, to her. But your Although comment, I've heard other people, they're like, well, did she just kill him? And now she's <laughs> making apple pie? I mean, you know, everyone has a different take. It's great fun. It tells I stories. love listening to other people's, you well, know. Like Rockwell, you fit a lot in one frame, and you're yep. telling a whole story yep. in one frame. I love that he ultimately didn't show marriage in this, like, blissful state. 
which one would think that Rockwell was wanting to do. I mean, I think that's kind of the misunderstanding of him. But look at them. And, and if you see right there, they're both voting for someone different. Yeah, there's no um, bliss there, I don't think. <laughs> so these images of Rockwell's, Rockwell seems to suggest that marriage is not a harmonious partnership. The ennui of his wife following the news of the stock market crash and for portending a lifestyle that was about to unravel. And the 1948 breakfast political argument over the Dewey versus Truman election that portrays a domineering husband yelling at his wife, instructing her how to vote, and her equally independent, stubborn countenance, while both ignore the crying baby. Neither picture is an image of domestic bliss or marital bliss. Susan, in your scenes, your, mar your scenes of marriage suge suggest dissolution also. Mm -hmm. um, tell us what you had in mind when you created these, um, and could you also tell us during that process a little bit about your working process, because people are always interested in sure. how one goes about making a picture, and you orchestrate so many roles in the painting that yeah. it would be wonderful to hear how you do that. I would actually visualize an image. It would just come to me. And then I would start twisting it. So I would take, you know, I would start twisting it into darkness. That was very important to me that I always, I, I got something that was beautiful, but then I, I had to bring a twist to it. Um, and I also wanted to work, it was very important to me that, that I wanted to work with humor. So I, I was creating tension in the, within the frame with humor and darkness. And then also I did a lot of opposites within the frame. Yep. So I'm working with, to create even more tension. So, and I'm also working with multiple layers. I'm always trying to layer an, uh, an image as much as I can. This one is called Baggage. I see it as, she's holding this quintessential black book and the husband, the partner, is leaving <coughs> her with the baggage of the relationship. But it also has another meaning to me where it's sitting in the daughter's hand as a pencil and it also could be her journal. And there was one day I was reading about Otis Frank, which was Anne Frank's father, and he had said that you never truly know someone until you've read their innermost thoughts. And so I wanted that to come alive in that image. <laughs> the idiom I worked with is over my dead body. And really, the crux of this image for me was looking at the loss of the sacred in death in America. I just, I feel like somewhere we lost that. And I use the gossip magazines to symbolize that uh, feeling that, that having gossip magazines is basically the, you know, the death of our culture in a way. And the daughter with her bubblegum laissez-faire attitude and the eight ball. And then in the background you see the older daughter already smitten with the new misses, or the newer, younger model. What did it feel like to pose in the cast? Yeah, that was odd. <laughs> I have to say, it was like this <laughs> monumental moment to climb inside of a casket. And OK, so also the process um, is that I set up my lighting first, or I, most of these images are in my home. This one, I actually did go to a funeral home. But mm -hmm. I'll go in beforehand. I'll set it all up. I'll set the lighting. I clearly have all the costumes prepared and then I bring the players on set and it, my camera's on a tripod and everything's set up and it's tethered to my computer so that I'm watching what I'm doing so that's it's a, it's, it's a production so you're using technology in the process Absolutely. as well oh, yes. or digital technology yes. I should and say at, all and at one point use I decided that I was not going to use <coughs> any modern technology within the frame I wanted them to be more timely that you couldn't tell exactly when it was created so I wanted to leave the eye, the handhelds offset Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the relentless pursuit of perfection in a home and with the handyman and contractor becoming part of the family and maybe in some ways that they never intended. Um, <laughs> constant state of remodeling to outdo the Joneses next door. And I, I, I love this image. I love the framing of her within the frame of the image and I did have the railing removed for this image <laughs> that was the direction want want to leave the house you know while you're doing that like be leaning forward so. your 
Yeah, they are. They are. <laughs> they are very patient models. <laughs> they, they were and, until they weren't, and then I stopped using them. Hence the minor project. <laughs> and, uh, Mom looks like she's anxious for everybody to leave the house, too. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this has a, a multiple meaning. The first level of meaning, a meaning is just a humorous look at marriage and the bedroom. And I also use color to represent characters' ideology. There's the conservative red, white, and blue, and then that more black, anarchic look. And that, that's also creating the tension, which is different viewpoints. Well, I love the stack of books next to his side of the bed, just the clock. The clock. Just the clock. <laughs> Such contrast, the barbed wire, the soft feather bed, you know, you really set up a lot of... Yeah, and that's all, all of those things are creating the tension within the frame, yeah. which is that softness and that hardness. And, the, and what's a marriage bed is about love, but then we have this thing of war right in the center of it, which, you know, marriage is all of that, right? A, a full marriage is everything, which is the beauty of it. And I was struck by what you said yesterday, how hard it is sometimes to reach across that yeah. chasm. Yeah. It's, and no matter, in the best of marriages, it's that how far it can be sometimes to just make that reach across. The role of parenting in Rockwell's work, there aren't actually a lot of pictures with parents, two parents or one parent and children. Most of Rockwell's works have children in them, sometimes children and grandparents, sometimes adults together, but there really were relatively few pictures that showed a concept of a nuclear family or a sort of traditional family in the way that everybody thinks Rockwell um, portrayed family. But I contrasted these two pictures, one from very early in his career, the cover for the Literary Digest, the mother tucking her daughter into bed, and of course the iconic Freedom from Fear, which became so well known as one of the four freedoms. Rockwell's own situation with his mother was not a close one. And so Susan observed yesterday, perhaps he was painting this idea of maternal nurturing. In your work, Susan, see um, really this interplay between the sexual wife and the selfless, sexist Madonna mother. And everyone wants a piece of mom, as you talked yeah. about in that first one. Some of these works are quite challenging and uh, uncomfortable in their beauty and in their sexuality. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you're trying to reflect in that when you choreograph these scenes. And you see here, Mother's Milk. I have to admit, it's one of my favorites. I love, I think I just hit this perfect twisted darkness. It's my reflection on parenting and like how sometimes we may hold on to our children a little too long in this day and age. And so she's breastfeeding this like five-year-old child, except the five-year-old child has lipstick and then the cigarette butts have the lipstick that match her. Um, so it's kind of like who's the adult and who's the child. And um, that kind of gets mixed up in my generation of parenting sometimes. <laughs> this is, uh, I used the idiom a ticking time bomb. And it was kind of my exploration of all the headlines that I kept reading about the children who were, you know, playing with guns. I often bring the lover character in, and um, here I feel like he represents any sort of distraction, an addiction, um, what have you, that, you know, we are, we're missing what's happening in front of us. Um, and, you know, sexuality, I think sexuality sells. So I think that I definitely used it as a vehicle to pull people in and to attract them. I was thinking of these as a glossy magazine, like the seduction of a glossy magazine and all those amazing um, advertisements that come in Vanity Fair, like the first 75 pages, <laughs> all these amazing advertisements. And I really wanted that effect of, um, of the cell and of, you know, come and look come and see, but then I'm going to show you something else. Ask you to think. So we move on to look at uh, this idea of angelic motherhood. And as I started to say in the last Rockwell slide, this was not the experience Rockwell had with his own mother. He describes in his autobiography that she was very sickly 
in his young years growing up and that his father took care of his mother quite often and of the children. And I think we often think of or see mothers are expected to be saintly, selfless, and put the needs of their children first. Rockwell didn't really have a sense or a notion of what this felt like on a personal level because his mother was not really a presence in the lives of her children. Today, we might understand that she might have suffered postpartum depression. We don't know. We will never know. But his experience with his mother was not uh, this, and I think Susan observed yesterday, perhaps he was recreating the childhood he would have liked to have. Um, but in this, these two pictures, he depicts mother in this role of the saintly mother, more so in the early works. And, and of course, understanding in Rockwell's work, these early works, he was a very young man. He started painting at age 18, 21. He had an early marriage. He didn't have children until he was nearly 40. So he didn't move into fatherhood um, until middle of his life. So as we age and move along in our life cycles, we understand parenting, we understand different roles better as we become them. So in his early years, he had to imagine what, you know, what did these roles maybe look like. But Susan's uh, images of motherhood are filled with contradiction. And as you've said, they really help, they try to express the full range of womanhood within motherhood. And maybe um, you can talk about uh, these yep. two old habits. <laughs> Well, I feel first before I explain that is that what I really wanted to do was to not put motherhood on a pedestal. I wanted to, or female on a pedestal, because we run into a lot of problems when we, we raise them up. And that includes darkness and all that questioning and negativity and not just the, <coughs> not, not just the beauty. I was compelled to create this image because I was still living in Manhattan at the time, and I was I would get a stack of Christmas cards about this big, and everyone was so happy. And like perfect. And I was like, oh my gosh, what would I do if I created something like what I really wanted to create, like my own Christmas card, and I just did it, and um, and so I came up with this. Contrast so great. Typically, when I'm working, I shoot between 300 to 600 images, I would say, to, in order to get one that I feel like everyone's spot on, especially with an ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, time and time again, it, uh, I would say like 500 of, 100 of them, I have my daughter, the older one, looking out like that. Like I already knew what I wanted. It was very clear. It's not like I'm trying to discover what it was. That I had a clear vision. It's just that I'm looking for intention behind the eyes. So I, I truly look at them as my little actors, they're little players, and I told them, I said, I want you to pretend, and each one of them had a different, I asked them to think of something different, and so I asked the little one that you are seeing someone, um, you know, trip and fall down, or you are seeing, you know, someone hit someone over the head with a pan, you know, so she could like, it was like something very visual and quick. Because um, she knew I wasn't twisting the dog's head, so that was hard for her to, you know, <laughs> visualize. And then the other one I wanted to have a more of a worried, concerned look. This is probably my most autobiographical image. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I was kind of just like making fun of myself <clears throat> and sweating the small stuff. You know, just like, come on. So this isn't close. your Glenn Close image. This is just <laughs> like, life's not so bad. Don't, don't strangle a puppy. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, or maybe. I don't know. <clears throat> or maybe it is. Yeah, Some know, days. I, I kind of just went there, and I just kind of wanted to make fun of myself in an exaggerated <laughs> way. And I even put the camera up really high so that it made my head look almost cartoonish. So I chose this title, Babies Are Trouble. <laughs> Uh, but this isn't how we think of babies being portrayed in the media. I mean, babies are usually cherubic, presented as cute, adorable as little pets. And children are viewed as a source of joy and fulfillment. Yet as parents, I think we have all had our days keeping <laughs> patience around our children. And in these two humorous images, Rockwell seems to portray babies as troublesome little burdens, packed off with Big Brother, or the babysitter to be taken care of, not a mother in sight or on call. And uh, Susan, your reference in Spare the Rod is even darker. What's going on here with these little terrorists? <laughs> this was an earlier 
work. I would think I was about fourth into my, this was about the fourth one into the series. And I just was, I asked everyone to bring something that was meaningful on set, so it's kind of personal. Now, what do you think your daughters uh, think that you've got them tying you to a chair, covering your heads with a Oh, that mask. was just fun and play. It was just fun, yeah, okay. We were having fun. Well, it moves right on into Rockwell's Spunky Girls. And um, I think what we usually do see in Rockwell's work are these very strong portrayals of girls in their childhood, um, in their adolescence, in their growing up, and as we'll see, um, coming into their womanhood. And uh, in this, wailing babies grow up to become independent little girls. One of Rockwell's great motifs are these spunky girls who might have in that era been called tomboys in, in that day and age. And he carries this motif forward right into the strength of the little girl walking to school and the problem we all live with that Anastasia mentioned earlier, which is just in the far gallery there. And in fact, Ruffles girls are quite strong. And in these next two pictures, Mother's Day, and I'll hold the title on the Spunky next girls. one. <laughs> the home seems to be falling into anarchy run by the children. Yeah. What's going on? Well, I love this because, you know, sometimes the kids were also the victims, and, or I'm the victim, and here, like, things have been tossed and turned, and turned upside down. And I shot that about, oh, I think I reshot that three different separate times. I had three different renditions, and finally I came up with that one. Um, a witching hour. <laughs> I don't need to explain that. <laughs> we, all, we all understand that one. We've all been there. So uh, the other thing I observed in Rockwell's work is quite often mother is in charge. And of course, we know that's true in, in uh, our own real lives and in uh, past eras. And we see here these two Rockwell pieces, the walking to church and the Easter, Sunday Easter morning, where um, you know, the dad's slinking out of going to church. And the young boy is like, come on, dad, can't I stay with you? Or why don't you have to go? I think despite living in, in still and then largely a paternalistic century, we see these images where the mother is in charge and the mother is um, determining the, the family uh, patterns and are often the strength that holds a family together. Single moms, moms who were home with children while their fathers were away in military or working long hours, um, mothers are strong. And in uh, these two images, we contrast it with Sugar Rush and Mommy's Little Helper, where Mother seems trapped in a domestic drama of ritual and perfection while all around her is crumbling. She's clearly all by herself. So the windows are separating the children out. The allure of Sugar is calling the children in. Um, but she doesn't look too happy. And then we also have the suit who uh, is reoccurring up in the heaven almost, um, his reflection, um, and he's kind of like this foamy presence. I, I'm also thinking about, just in society, how sugar has that allure and that pool of our children today. And it's the, um, also my look at food and women in our culture as well. And there's such a sense of abundance and perfection yes. in the confections in that picture. Yes. Did you make them all? Did you bake them no, all yourself? I have to say I did not. Okay. Yeah. There's a reason I asked that. You'll get to it. Yeah, typically <laughs> yeah. I do, but this one I, I couldn't handle it. Narcissism. Narcissism. We'll help each in other out. Society, three images of her face right there in one frame. Um, and all her helpers. She's having everyone surround her and helping her get through her day. Right? She's got the alcohol. The suit is helping her. She's he's getting the alcohol for her. She's got her pills. And her Bottles children are keeping her, you know, one's pulling her hair up, which I actually even imagine she was pulling her hair up so she would pull the skin up to keep her face wet. <laughs> and sweeping something under the rug. Yes. Susan, thank you. That ends our series of domestic bliss. And um, <laughs> I think we really had some good conversations about the, the totality of family life and the contradictions and multiple... Um, feelings that we have in all of our roles. Um, so thank you for walking us um, through those. And, and these were the precursor to prompting you to write and direct a film. Yes. And we're going to look at that. I didn't direct it, but um, produce and 
act in it and write it and yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of you so, yeah, in it. So we're, it's a seven minute short. Um, we're gonna just watch it in silence and um, get to enjoy hearing Susan talk about it afterwards. It's called The Cupcake.
Now you wrote this yep. script. Yep. You direct, well, you didn't direct, didn't direct it, but it. you did the director. costuming, you did um, the makeup, you did yeah, the everything. lighting, you did everything. Um, yeah, you so, were and I produced it all. Um, and, and Nathan worked with me. Nathan Buck was the director. I hired him in, and he also helped me write the screenplay of it. Um, but yeah, it was great. Um, we <coughs> did it in a weekend. We worked all night long, so as the sun was coming up, we were trying to finish the last scenes of darkness, and then we had to do some more in the morning. Um, so yeah, fun. Did, um, did you notice who she saw in the window? Herself. Yeah. yeah. Herself. Good. <laughs> yeah, those of you who didn't hear, it was herself. herself. She saw herself with so the black eye. Yeah. If it's being viewed like in a gallery or a museum, I take the credits out and I just go on an endless loop. So it becomes like this endless loop of denial, you know, because she is she going to help herself when that self comes and knocks and she opts out of helping and just shoving food down her throat. So. And when I first saw her, I thought it was her child and she was locking her child out of the house. Yeah. But then you after when you see her in the window, you see it's... Yeah. Herself. Yeah. yeah. And all, uh, some people say it looks like uh, her younger self, which also could be that whole psychological thing of, you know, the, the younger child. Uh, the the younger child. Yeah. And that striving for perfection. That yes. Perfect. Yeah. 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 So I think it was my, um, when I moved out of Manhattan and moved up here, you know, the darkness scared me. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, it was so overwhelming. <laughs> and I think that this story came out of it. Um, and I was making cupcakes one day for my daughter's birthday, whatever. And, um, and I just kind of started thinking of the scenario. So, <laughs> it's really wonderful. It. Really you. wonderful. <clears throat> well, uh, this next picture is a wonderful segue to the last series that we're going to talk about tonight. The, um, this is this one image, Game Changer, uh, I think is a provocative transition to your new series um, that you're working on. And in uh, From Cupcake to he, then, then He Forgot My Name, um, there's a sense of abandonment combined with hopefulness of a new beginning in this picture. What are you trying to tell us in this work? Well, before I um, talk about this image, I just want to say, um, Then He Forgot My Name is my new project. And I started working on it because my father had been diagnosed with dementia. And I started going back to my family's home in Youngstown, Ohio. And I, for some reason, felt like I needed an excuse to go back more often than not. So um, I would go, and my brother at one point said, hey, Susan, why don't you come and see that building I bought like 25 years ago in downtown Youngstown? And so we went and we visited it, and it was so amazing and beautiful in this perfect state of decay and gorgeousness. And I turned to him and I said, may I use this building for my next project? And so then we did, I began that. Um, and this is... Um, you know, as my brother, my brother's a very unique individual, and he has this building for 25 years he's never touched, but then he has this VW that he used to ride in the University of Cincinnati, um, and he parked it in his building. And I'm like, this is so perfect. Oh my god. <laughs> a, a VW van inside interior of a building. I, I couldn't have placed it better. And, and it's not working, so I have to plug in a battery and everything, they have the light headlights working and everything. For me, when I work, I like to look at an overarching story through my entire work. So I'm always trying to connect imagery and even costuming from one project to the next. So here's the, the yellow dress. Um, there are other yellow dresses in Domestic Bliss. There seems to be this yellow dress theme that goes on. And I see it kind of a metaphor for um, a new beginning. So she's running over, metaphorically, her dress. And she's killing something to make way for something new. So that was our uh, transition between this last uh, section that Susan told you a little bit about. And I thought we would just think for a moment about Rockwell's strong women. Because in this next section, um, I, was, I was struck, as you will see, 
in the images in a moment, of the women seeming as victims, damsels in distress, uh, who are often seen as weak in our society. And the notion of how strong a woman really has to be to fall or even fail and get up again and face another day <coughs> takes tremendous strength in reality. And here in these iconic images that Rockwell created of strong women, Rosie the Riveter or the Liberty Girl, uh, when women stepped into the workforce and did all the men's jobs during World War II as well as all their domestic jobs and being mothers and raising the children and uh, really running the country while almost every uh, male of able body was in the military services. Um, was such a strong chapter in how Rockwell viewed and portrayed these women. And as Susan uh, talks about this next series, which has come to take on multiple meanings, as Anastasia talked about in the beginning, um, since it was sparked by your father's descent into dementia, with the Me Too movement and the national awakening of voices of women, African Americans, and now our youth uh, movement sparked by gun violence. And we're seeing the strengthening and empowerment of these voices. So these images you're about to see, um, and I'm not going to offer any commentary during them. We're gonna hear Susan's insights into them. Some of them she may just invite you to look at because they're exquisitely beautiful. They're powerful, they're evocative. And I'll just ask uh, Susan to talk us through them as she wishes. Um, and I think of them uh, very much as beauty in decay, which really in our own lives, we're all dying a little bit every day as we live a little bit more every day. And when you start to go through death or the experience of someone close to you dying, you realize we all live every day and we all die a little bit every day and that is part of the natural life cycle, this sense of decay. So we will have time for questions at the end, but we'll go through this series uh, rather quietly and let Susan offer uh, what's bubbling up in her because this is a series in process and something she's living uh, with right now and they're, they're just beautiful. Uh, so as Laurie said, as I am, it's a work in progress and so for me to unload each image, I really can't, I'm still in working on these. So um, I'll just offer some stories. Um, so this is the building um, that we I'm shooting in. And um, I did a lot of research about the building and all the different tenants that inhabited the space. And I would say that the building went up around 1890-ish um, and had many different tenants. And so these were kind of my, me ruminating on the women. And not that men didn't live in this building, but it was my take and I was saying, okay, if, what were these women going through or what were they experiencing and um, whatnot. And I, we were having a conversation yesterday and Lori said, oh, they look so victimized. And I had this like, what do you mean they're victimized? And like that's how, I didn't say that to her, but I was kind of, I kind of felt like that. But then I'm like, you know what? We all are in some ways as women, but we choose to then spin it around and do something differently with it. Just because within this cultural, how we live and what we've discovered recently, how um, insidious it all is, we've realized that, you know, we all have been victimized in some ways, just the way the constructs are set up. And, but we choose to get up every morning and continue and continue to change things. Yeah, so I was shooting this, I think it was the third time, separate time I was shooting this image. So I set up and I do it and I go home a lot of times and I look at my images and pour over them and say, what's going on here, what am I doing? I'll go back again and this is a trip, it's an eight hour trip. So, you know, sometimes I go back and I reshoot. This is my third reshoot and Donald Trump happened to be three blocks down at a rally after he's already been elected. I'm like, he's had one of those rallies anyway. Um, and I just thought it was amazing that I was shooting this image because I suddenly felt, you know, that my country was in a state of decay and it was, you know, free falling and there it is, the American flag. It's just kind of, you know, it's tattered, it's a little old. Probably a year into my images. And I knew that the image, the project was about my father and it was about the decay of a building and the decay of my own life. And 
But I was like, yeah, there's got to be something more here. I, you know, I like to have multiple meanings to my projects. And so I was looking at all my images, and I was just kind of studying them and going over them. All of a sudden, I realized that every image had either red, white, or blue as a central theme. And I'm like, wow. So it's not just my own personal decay, but it's our cultural decay that, that I was trying to suppress in some ways. That, you know, once Trump became president, I, I was like, this is not about him. This is my project. And, but that I couldn't help myself. And subconsciously, it was bubbling up. And that, um, so it, it was interesting to see that all those feelings were still coming out in my images, even though I didn't want to deal with them. Um, but then I started working that and, and using that. You spoke yesterday that in this image, you felt this was Hillary. Oh, yeah. Her fall. Yeah, when I did this, um, I felt like, or it was the Democratic Party or Hillary falling. It was just a metaphor. <clears throat> this is when I first really, I'm really affected by the election. And what am I going to do? And this is how I feel. Like, I feel like I'm hung over. I, I had this feeling of just being hung over for months. And I still didn't quite know what I was doing, but this was, it's what I felt. And it wasn't until I came back and started really pouring over my images and dissecting them. What am I saying? What am I doing? And that's when I titled this. I love this one. It's just all this, like, psychological layered interior world. It's like, it's this character's interior of the uh, bus, this interior of a building that's, um, then I also feel like it's like interior of her mind also that's kind of just emanating out. So I, I did a bunch of research. I went to the Youngstown um, Historical Society and did a bunch of research on these and um, uh, on the history of the tenants. And one of the tenants was there for 50 years and they were a tailor. And so there were a lot of, I did a lot of work with found objects in the building. So I didn't bring any of this stuff in. It was just there. And being stuck in Youngstown, Ohio, like that was, that's my hometown, but Youngstown has been left behind. It's a depressed area and it has been hit by drugs in the 80s back when, um, and the steel mills closing in the late 70s and it just never recovered itself and it's also now caught in the whole opioid epidemic like in a major way always working with lighting lighting was a really big part of this project use all sorts of lighting i use um, continuous lighting flash lighting um, strobe all sorts anything um, bouncing anything i could do to get it you know, we no longer have phones like this. And <laughs> I was playing with it. And, um, and just the idea, like, I, I don't know if you could see it, but my fingers even wrapped around the cord. And how this next generation won't even ever experience that. And standing at a phone and being tethered. And you can only move so far. Um, and how it's also the first time that another person has been brought into the frame because there's someone on the other end. And um, so that's interesting, and I want to consider that as I move forward with the project. Um, I like the idea of another person being brought in, not, you know, specifically, but like, just kind of like that, metaphorically. Or and also, telephone calls. Sometimes it's good news, and sometimes it's bad news. So I feel like after all is said and done, Politics, power, cultural, social movements, wars, we're still left with life. And we have to deal with it. And she's rising. She's coming out of it, but she's still within frame, and she's still dealing with life. And she's naked. I love that. I love that she, yeah, she's not, she's not covering anything. She's just there, exposed. So this is just a fraction of it, of my project. I have 27 images so far. Um, I still want to work. And I'm still inspired. It's still a work in process. Yeah. They're just beautiful. Susan, we thank you for um, sharing these intimate portraits and thank opening you. up your life um, and the interior of women's lives. And your art is just beautiful. I thank think um, all would agree that the, the whole story and the technical values and composition and is as beautiful as the sentiments and 
thoughts that you're working to express. I think you've challenged and broadened our notion of the feminine, uh, the complexity of the roles of mother and wife, and you've invited us to think about the whole person and challenged the archetype of female perfection and that we're really perfect in our whole selves and our multiple selves uh, rather than necessarily a single ideal. I think it's fair to say women's voices are becoming stronger. There's a wonderful spread in the New York Times I saw today. They are going back in history and they're bringing forward obituaries of women who uh, played significant roles in our nation's history but never had an obituary in the New York Times because they have almost always been white male lives who warranted a New York Times obituary. There are 15 on this first batch that are online today. They, they might be coming out in the magazine, um, but they're going to do this regularly and begin to bring history forward as well as changing how they look at who's selected as a significant life um, in the future. And we look forward to seeing in your work an invitation for our voices to speak uh, with their full complexity and contradiction, uh, without stigma and without judgment. So thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Thank this you has really that. been a pleasure.